This talk is about my search for the uh, a good UPnP hacking tool. So what we're going to go over today is just some introductions, tell you who I am. Uh, first, I'll start talking about what is UPnP and why should you care about UPnP? Uh, why was I looking for a tool to hack UPnP in the first place? I'll talk about some of the tools that are out there right now um, and what I found to be their shortcomings and why I, I thought that they weren't quite sufficient. I will show you um, a, a new, an updated tool that I put a lot of updates into and, and I'll, I'll talk about the features of that. And throughout, we'll do some demos of that, that functionality and about UPnP in general. Um, Q&A was gonna be in the Discord chat, but I know Discord is down at the moment or there's some issues with it. So if, if that still happens, we'll probably just keep the, the Q&A here in the Twitch channel. All right, so who am I? Uh, real name is Trevor Stavato. I've been in, in offensive security for over 10 years, um, different positions, you know, mostly in uh, web app and network pen testing. Uh, a couple of years ago, I founded this cool little company called LabMath Security. Um, before I was in, in hacking, I was a software developer and I did that for a number of years and then realized all the mistakes I was making once I became a, a hacker. Um, I try to be an active member of the security community. Uh, as Sam said, I help do some IoT Village stuff uh, in Canada. I help sometimes in the US as well. Um, I like to dabble a little bit in RFID. So we do an RFID Village here in Canada and I do some uh, red teaming for the pros versus Joe CTF which unfortunately didn't happen this year because of all this COVID stuff. Uh, maybe one of my proudest achievements so far is the DEF CON 26 black badge win at the IoT CTF. All right, so let's talk about what UPnP is. So UPnP is universal plug and play. And it's a protocol defined, uh, I think back in 2008 was the original publication of this protocol, um, allowing for devices on the network to discover and interact with each other based around a principle called zero configuration networking. Really what they wanted to be able to do was to have a device that just plugged into a network, found other devices and was able to talk to and communicate with the other devices and, and have them um, configure themselves according to their needs without anybody having any, any actual input and hands-on keyboard configuration. Um, sounds like a great idea to me. So UPnP is, a, is a, a protocol that uses pretty standard services like HTTP, XML, and SOAP. And it defines a way for services to describe their functionality and as I said, interact with other, other devices. A lot of the common uses for this are for network services. So um, small office, home office routers will use this for configuring port forwarding. Um, there's data sharing services for network storage. Media streaming, for example, Chromecast, or you know, some of the original versions of Chromecast use UPnP to initiate the streams. Uh, and it's also used commonly in smart home control, which will be one of the demos that we're doing later on today. So in the spec, UPnP talks about kind of six capabilities or six things that, that are required for proper UPnP functioning. Uh, the first one is addressing. Um, it's not as important for the tool because we can't really talk to it unless it has a device, but the device needs a way to get an IP address. And this is typically done through DHCP. Um, the second one more interesting to us is a discovery protocol. So the devices need to be able to advertise their presence on the network or other devices need to be able to search for other UPnP devices on the network. So they, there's a protocol uh, called Simple Service Discovery Protocol, SSDP, that is used to do this advertisement. Uh, and I'll show one of those requests later and show how that, that works. Once you know what devices are on the networks, you need to know what those devices can do. What, and then there's a device description XML file that gives this detail. And when the devices broadcast their, their presence or another device searches for them, the URL to that XML file is part of the response that comes back. The next part is control. So once you know what it can do, you need to know how to control that device. Uh, you need to know what endpoint to send the request to, what parameters um, 
you need to include in the, the request. Once you have this information, now that's enough information to, to start interacting with that device. There are still a couple of other um, parts to UPnP. The fifth one is event notification. So you can subscribe to specific um, state variables on a device. And if that state variable changes, it'll send a notification to you. Uh, and then the last part of UPnP protocol is a presentation. Uh, for, for the topic of this talk, that's not as important because that just gets into sort of regular web app hacking, less UPnP hacking. So we're gonna focus on two to five in, in, with, this, with this talk. So I'm gonna show you uh, just a brief view of um, a device description and um, what that kind of looks like. So over here, I'm gonna run a search and you'll see the discovery message and I'll make this bigger because this might not be easy for people to see. So there's a discovery message that uses a custom HTTP verb called msearch. It posts to a um, broadcast address and this is just a fixed, this is the same on every network. Uh, it's got a, um, a message saying, trying SSDP discover and the service type in this case is SSDP all, which basically says all devices respond to me. And you can see the responses come back here from all the different devices showing you here is the, the um, location of my service or my device description. And it'll also give you some information about uh, what kind of device it is. So you can see on my network, there are a couple devices that have a lot of different services. Because we said SSDP all, all the services are responding um, separately. So now I'm gonna, we're gonna take a look at one of these and we'll show you what a, um, what a device description looks like. And let's make this bigger. So this here, you can see my my setup here on the on the other screen. Uh, I have an Asus router, I have a Wemo switch, and that is there's a little lamp plugged into that Wemo switch. So the device description we're seeing here is for the Asus router. It shows you the model number, the version numbers, uh, serial numbers, a lot of information about it. When we get down into this section, the service list, this is where we see the different services, the UPnP services that it supports. So it'll show you the URL that you need to send control requests to, the URL to send event requests to, and um, it'll also have, not in this one, but in some of them, it'll have the, um, oh yeah, no, here it is, the SCDP, so the service control um, description, so the service description. So if we copy this and we put this on here, well now, uh, Put a double backspot. backspot. There we go. Now we'll see uh, all the actions that this service supports, um, action name and all the arguments. So we can collapse all this and you can see there's gonna be a bunch of actions for this service. And then we get into this service state table that talks about all the state variables. And some of these will, won't will send events. So the send events is no, but some of these do. Uh, and those are the ones that we can subscribe to. So physical link status is a is a variable that we can subscribe to and get notifications when that status changes. So you can see how this can be used by devices to you know, uh, monitor what's happening in the network and, and be able to control it. So that's the overview of, of how these, th the sort of service descriptions and, and device descriptions work and what they look like. So one thing that's missing from this spec um, is that there's no authentication. Even on the control endpoints, when you're sending a control message, they are unauthenticated. It's a very old protocol, uh, as I said, 2008, so they probably didn't think about that part of it. Um, there have been some updates, some other optional pieces that you can tack on to add some, some authentication and some security to it. But those really, from my experience, I haven't seen any devices that use those. So most of this is just fully done unauthenticated. Um, so 
why does this relate to IoT? Why is it in IoT Village? A lot of IoT devices are using IO, uh, using UPnP. Um, it makes them very simple for setup and control. Uh, a lot of consumer devices, you know, they just want to make it simple. You take it home, you plug it in, and it works. So that's why UPnP is is helpful for that. Um, but as a you know, as a hacker, we can look at what can we do with that. So we can th do things like turning smart home devices on and off. And I'll do a demo later of the the Wemo switch turning that on and off. Um, one of the other things that UPnP has got in the news a lot for is the the ability to update the the router's um, configuration and, and open ports on the router so that it can you can forward from the WAN side, the internet side, into the internal network. Uh, and then, you, as I said, you can also control media devices. So I thought IoT has already so many vulnerabilities. There's got to be some UPnP, UPnP vulnerabilities, right? So that's why I wanted to look at UPnP as a as sort of an attack path. As I said, there's been a couple of notable exploits in the news. Uh, back in 2017, Akamai released a paper talking about UPN proxy. UPN proxy. Um, Basically, a lot of devices were configured to expose the uh, UPnP interface on their WAN on the WAN side. So you could send control events, things like uh, port forwarding, from the WAN side. So something somebody on the internet could control your router and could set port forwarding to get in get internal access to your network. And even some of the the rules, the the way that they were doing the, the port forwarding, they're not validating the fields. So you could port forward, um, you know, a port on the WAN side and forward it to a completely different URL somewhere else on the internet. So people were using this as a proxy, as, you know, their UPN proxy um, to hide, hide where they're coming from and sort of disguise their attacks. Back in 2019, there was a pretty famous attack uh, from Hacker Giraffe um, where they, they, Use basically that same functionality, uh, routers that were that were allowing configuration on their WAN side, to port forward to the Chromecast device, and then from there they could control the Chromecast device because it, it used UPnP as a as a way to stream a video to it, so they could control the, the Chromecast device and put a video that of their choosing on, and they they decided to put up a an advertisement to subscribe to PewDiePie, um, so that got a lot of news headlines. One of the more recent ones that I've come across uh, is the, this vulnerability called Call Stranger, um, and it's a 2020 vulnerability. It, it's really interesting when you look at this because basically what he did is he looked at the UPnP spec and just noticed that there's some some bad design in the spec. Um, so the I talked about the event subscription part of this. The there's a callback of the event subscription. So you tell it where to call back when something changes, but there's no validation at this point done on that callback. So you can have that be, uh, you know, uh, some other address on the internet. You can use it to, you can add query strings on it. So you could use it for data exfiltration if you wanted to get stuff out of a network kind of sneakily. Um, there's also some amplifications type uh, ramifications to this because you send a very small request and the request that comes back or gets forwarded to that that notification server is much larger in size. So you can you could potentially do some sort of denial of service using that amplification. Um, so we'll look at, at that and show you how that how that's done. So when I went looking for my, the UPnP tool you know, there's basic things that I would want a UPnP tool, tool to do. First, I wanted to discover all the devices on my network. Um, I, I don't want to have to go out there and look for it. I want this tool to be able to find them. Once it finds them, it should be able to parse the description, find the services and actions and events. It's, you know, XML is pretty straightforward and easy to, to parse, so that should be straightforward. And then to be able to build and manipulate the UPnP requests, that needs to be something simple that I can, um, you know, easily do and potentially ideally fuzz that, that interface. So let's look at some of the tools that are out there and, and how I found that they worked. Now, this is an, isn't an exhaustive presentation of what's out there. These are just the more common ones that I've come across. Um, the first one is Miranda, and it's available in Cali out of the box. 
uh, has a nice command line syntax, would, if you like that kind of thing. Uh, but on the con side of things, I found it doesn't always work. Um, in, in the case, I just ran it yesterday on my home network. It can find the devices by doing an M search, but it seems to have trouble parsing some of the service description files. So it comes back with an empty list of services and, and it can't do any sort of control of the actions. Also, command line syntax, in my opinion, isn't as nice for interacting with these requests and, and I'm, I just don't find it as, as nice to use. The next tool that I looked at, and I was actually really excited about this tool, was the Burp UPnP B Hunter. Uh, it's available in the Burp App Store. Because UPnP is HTTP based, um, XML SOAP, all that kind of stuff works really well in Burp. And it works really well in Burp's other tools like Intruder and Repeater. So I thought this was a great place to have that kind of functionality. But when I started using it, there were some major problems that I had where it wouldn't detect all the devices on the network. Some of the devices that I knew that were there, it, it wasn't picking them up. Um, and sometimes the parsing wasn't working. It wasn't able to parse the service descriptions and, and uh, get access to all the, the different control points. Lastly, I, I found the interface just wasn't so easy. When I, my home network, I do have a lot of IoT devices plugged in. And when I do a UPnP scan, I get back five or six devices. Each of them have many service descriptions uh, and, and uh, lots of control endpoints. And the, the version that's in App Store right now basically has very little fine green control over what requests you send to intruder or repeater. And, and sometimes even you don't have control over where you send it to is either one or the other. But I was ending up with you know, 100 repeater tabs of requests and trying to dig through 100 tabs to find the one request that I wanted to fuzz or, or test. It's just not very uh, user-friendly in my opinion. So, you know, what's a, a wannabe UPnP hacker guy like me gonna do? Um, as I said, there's other tools. There are things like UFUDS that's based on Miranda. So it's gonna have the same sort of shortcomings that Miranda has. Uh, there's some .NET tools, but I, I don't really work on a Windows laptop very much. So .NET is not that that conducive for me. Um, so, you know, I was kind of looking at a few different options. I, I keep looking, see if there's other tools out there. I build a new tool from scratch or I modify an existing tool that's already out there. So being Canadian, I turned to my my good friend and my my neighbor, Drake, and I said, what should I do? He told me, don't build a new, new tool from scratch. You got to modify something that's already existing out there. So th that brings me to my version of Burp UPnP Hunter. I thought that it had the best sort of, um, you know, potential for for a tool because of its inter, um, integration into Burp and some of the other tools that you can use with Burp. But first, we had to get through some of the bugs that that were it was facing right now. So, the first one, the fact that it didn't detect all the UPnP devices on the network, I found that this comes down to some devices just don't follow the spec very well. Um, it was sending the M search using an SSDP all, which I showed earlier, and all devices are supposed to respond to that, but some devices, they just don't. So I added an, a different M search. So it does two M searches, one using SSDP all, and one using another tag called root device. And that only the root device is supposed to respond to that, not all the different services. That, that seemed, <clears throat> pardon me, that seemed to work a little bit better for uh, some of the devices that were on my network. So I was able to find all of the devices on my network at that point. I still had some issues though with parsing uh, in this tool. There was an interesting unsigned integer conversion error. So burp is written in Java and Java byte arrays go from negative 127 to positive 127. But Python, which this tool is written in, has byte arrays go from zero to, to uh, 256. So in most characters, that doesn't really matter because you're still in the 0 to 127 range. But when you get into special characters and you get a, a, a signed byte array from Java going into Python, things don't work so well. So I had to do some, some tricks to convert that back to a, an unsigned byte array um, so that, that you know no, no matter what we got in the service description, special characters or not, it wasn't going to going to work on me. 
Um, I also found that the control URLs, the way that it was parsing the control URLs from the service, from the device description, it didn't account for the fact that some devices add query strings to the to the control URLs. So they have a generic control URL, but they have a query parameter that that it uses to determine what service or what you're you're trying to talk to. And without that, it just gave me back a bad request. So I had to modify the, the tool to actually use the the query string that was part of the, the control URL. Lastly, um, there were still other issues with the XML, with the parsing. It, it wasn't actually doing XML parsing in the first version. It was using a regex to try to search through the XML document to, to pull out the pieces that it needed. And if you had an XML document that wasn't structured the way it expected, then it wouldn't work. So I switched it to use actual XML parsing because you know that just makes sense. I also changed the UI for the tool. Um, I Because I didn't want to have to dig through 100 tabs in repeater, I added some combo boxes where you can now select the IP, the service, and the action. So you can drill in on the specific request that you want to look at and, and play with. Uh, I added a full request viewer and editor. So you can, you can look at that and maybe change things before you send it to intruder or repeater. And I, you have the option to send it to either. You're not sort of tied into one or the other like you were in the first version. And lastly, I added a couple new features to the tool. So um, there is, I added the ability to subscribe to event notifications. So it, it parses that service description, looks for state variables that have events turned on. And then it will build a request for you that, that you can generate a subscribe request to subscribe to those state variables. Um, I also added an option to specify the dev single device description. So instead of searching your network, you can specify a remote service description. Searching only works on your local network because you're, you're broadcasting to a an address within your local network. So only devices within that local network are gonna work. But if you're if you go on Shodan, there's a lot of UPnP devices on Shodan that are exposed to internet. If you want to play with those, now you can because you can paste that service description into there directly and load that and, and get all the actions. Uh, I also added some some little buttons so you can view pull up the service description and SD, SCDP files directly from the tool. Uh, that was kind of a more of a convenience for me as I was debugging and find, trying to figure out why things weren't working to easily get to the device description and, and those files made it a little bit easier to see what I'm I'm looking at. And now it's demo time. So we'll go through that tool and show you what it actually does. So UPnP Hunter 2.0. Right now it is not available in the Burp App Store. I do plan to push it to the Burp App Store uh, at some point later. I first wanted to wait and give the original author a chance to pull in some of the changes that I I pushed and um, maybe update the tool from there. He doesn't seem to have the interest to do that, so I will push this as a, as a separate standalone version. So this is the tool. This is what it looks like in the Burp tab. Uh, and I'm just going to go ahead and start a discovery on my network. And this will take a few minutes because, as I said, it's, it's running the the M search, reading back all the, the responses and then parsing out. So on this network, I have two devices that are running UPnP. This is the Asus router, as we saw before. This one is the Belkin Wemo device. And this is the list of all the service endpoints that uh, it understands. And if you look at the different actions, these are all the actions within that service endpoint. So I'll just pull up the SCDP here for a second. And so you can see, you know, action to get device information. That should be in here somewhere. Yeah, get device information. And then once you select it, it pulls up the request. It builds out the request in this field here. So you can view it, see what uh, what different parameters it takes. And then you can send that straight to repeater or to intruder. And you'll see that repeater picked it up. And now it's here and I can send this request and get device information from, from that request, from that device. Um, so that's, you know, very, very basically, that's how it works. So let's, let's show you why this is cool and, you know, what we can do with this. So one of the things that's very easy to do with the Belkin Wemo device is uh, controlling its, its on and off state. So it, 
it's called binary state. Um, so we are going to find the request that's set binary state. And we can see there's a few different parameters here, and, and the parameter values are just filled with fuzz here, telling you where you can actually put input. And we'll send that to repeater. We'll take all this fuzz here stuff out. And the only one that really is needed for most basic operation is the binary state. So I'm going to set the binary state to one, which should be on. And as you see over here, the light flips on and I get a response that now the binary state is on and some other, some other information. And now I can set the binary state back to zero and the light goes off. So very simple, easy control of the device state through UPnP. Um, let's talk a little bit about uh, event subscription. So in here, you will see a subscribe request. And the, it again uses a custom HTTP verb, subscribe. This is the path pulled out of the device description. And then again, there's a bunch of places where you can fuzz. Uh, here in this section is where you put the, the parameters that where you want the callback to come to. You can set a timeout for how long you want to uh, get notified of, of those event changes. And then this is a comma separated list of all the different parameters that this device will give event notifications for. So I already have one of these queued up over here. Let's see. So if everything is still working the way it should, I will get a device description, or, or sorry, event notification here saying the, um, that is not what I expected. Hang on a sec. Property change, property state is zero. Okay, sorry, that is what I expected. Now, if I go back to the basic event request and I change the state back to one, now I get another notification coming in on that callback with the, the binary state as one. So we see the notifications and how they come back. Um, what's interesting about the notifications and, and what this call stranger vulnerability sort of talks about is you can specify multiple endpoints that this calls back to. Um, one of the neat sort of features of this is that if the first request doesn't, if the first um, URL doesn't, it can't reach it, it doesn't get a response from it, then it will try the next request, the next uh, IP. So you can actually make use of this to do some internal port scanning uh, of things on the network. If you can access this on the WAN side, for example, you can, you can use this feature um, specify a host and a port, and then specify a host and a port that you know it can reach. And if you get the callback coming to uh, to your IP address, you know that it wasn't able to connect to the the previous one. Um, so that's kind of a fun little little thing you can do with the the subscribe feature. But uh, really, that's I guess sort of the end of my demonstration of this tool. Um, I think it can be really powerful especially being able to send stuff to intruder and, and do some fuzzing with this. Um, and uh, I can also show you here that if we just take this, this device description, paste it in here, then we get just that, that device description's services. We don't get all the others. So you can use that as well to sort of narrow down or, or look at remote ones, like I said. Um, and I think that is it. So the, the repository for this is in our GitLab. Link is here. Uh, as I said, I, I do plan on pushing this to the Burp App Store at some point in the future, um, but it's just not there right now.